Welcome, sisters, to our first class. We're, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, it is my privilege to introduce our presenter for this class, Sister Kathy Harris. Kathy Harris was born in Moscow, Idaho, and her parents moved to Twin Falls when she was a baby, so she has grown up here in Twin Falls. She is married to Reed Harris, and they have six children and 12 grandchildren with a 13th coming in September. She served with her husband as mission president of the <coughs> Chile Rancagua, Rancagua Mission from 2016 to 2019, and they both currently serve as the Twin Falls Temple President and Matron. Sister Harris loves music. She has played in orchestras and taught violin lessons for many years. She also does a lot of canning and gardening. But her greatest joy comes from being with and serving her family and serving the Lord. I am so grateful for my personal connection with Kathy over the many years um, as our and some of our children have grown up together. I have always admired her poise and wisdom and goodness and kindness, and I know that we will all be blessed as she connects with all of us today. Sister Harris. Thank you, Sister Crowley. It's a blessing to be here. Even as nervous as I've been about this, <laughs> this presentation, I'm so thankful to be here with you. Feel the Spirit of the Lord in your sake and my wonderful sisters. Love you and appreciate this opportunity to talk to you this morning. It is such an awesome blessing to serve in the temple. And you know the wonderful spirit that is there. And today, our purpose is to help us to better understand the importance of covenants that connect us to Jesus Christ. And in all honesty, the temple is all about connections. We connect to the Savior. We connect to our Father in Heaven. We connect families. That's, that's what we do there, is we connect families. Couples to each other and children to their parents. And parents to their children. It's such a wonderful blessing to, to serve in the temple. So we live in an unprecedented time of temple building. And this is just a little side thing that I kind of got hung up on. When I was 12, and could go to the temple for the first time to do baptisms, there were 13 operating temples on the earth. And we got in a bus and we drove to Idle Falls and we did our baptisms there. Nine years later, when I received my endowment in the Provo Temple and we were sealed in the Salt Lake Temple ten days later, there were 17 temples, so an increase of, what, four temples in nine years. In 1998, there were 51 temples operating, and it was 1998 when President Hinckley announced the program to build smaller temples, and he announced 30 temples. And then he said, well, he said, but the temples that are under construction right now, if we add two more to that, we'll have 100 temples by the turn of the century. So he announced two more temples after that conference. And in the year 2000, we had 100 temples operating, announced in various, in various stages of construction. And we just thought that was wonderful, 100 temples throughout the earth. And I think about that because when I was in college, several friends and I had this bucket list. What if we went to every temple in the world? <laughs> well, 17, that was kind of believable, but there's no way we get to every temple now, I think. 18 years later, when President Nelson became our prophet, there were 182 temples operating or in various phases of construction that are being announced for planning. And in the five years that he has been our prophet, he has announced 115 temples. And we are now at 315 temples in various processes of preparation, construction, and planning. I just think that's awesome. What a miracle that's happening. And I can remember as a child thinking about 
we need to perform ordinances for every person that's ever lived on the earth or will live. And I thought, well, that's, that's impossible. How will that happen? But now with the internet and with our resources, we live in the day where there are resources and covenant people to do this work, and it's only going to continue to increase. I just think that's such a blessing. And in the five years that President Nelson has been our prophet, the one recurring theme that we hear from him almost every time he speaks has to do with temples and what they can do for us. Now, I have some quotes up here, and I've asked Gail to take a microphone and just start it in a row, and if you're willing to read, if you'll read the quote, and then pass the microphone to the next person, and if you don't want to read, just pass it on to the next one. So as we, as we go through these slides, we'll just let you take turns reading. Sister, do you mind starting here with this quote by Elder Medna? Our purpose in building temples is to make available the holy places wherein the sacred covenants and ordinances necessary for the salvation and exaltation of the human family can be administered for both the living and the dead. Thank you. So our purpose for temples is to participate in covenants and ordinances that connect us to Jesus Christ. Why temples? Christ is the reason we build temples, making covenants and receiving essential ordinances in the temple, as well as seeking to draw closer to him there, will bless your life in, in ways no other kind of worship can. For this reason, we are doing all within our power to make the blessing, blessings of the temple more accessible for our members around the world. So that's why we are spending the resources and the time and the effort. Can you imagine what it takes to plan 115 temples? to find the sites, to have the plans, to manage the resources, the building construction. That is just overwhelming to me when I think about that. But the reason we're doing it is so that we can be connected to Jesus Christ and have those blessings that are available only in the temple. So, I want to talk a little bit about covenants and why covenants are so important. But in order to do that, we need to go clear back to the Lord's plan of salvation. So we all know we lived with our Father, our heavenly parents, before this earth in the pre mortal existence. And we loved our parents and they loved us and they want, wanted us to have every, every opportunity and blessing that they have, just like we want for our children. And we wanted to be like them, but we needed a body. And we needed so to receive a body, there needed to be an earth. So an earth was created, and we were given agency, the opportunity to choose righteousness. Sometimes we think agency is the opportunity to do anything we want. We can choose. But God-given agency was given to us so that we would choose righteousness, and we could do it on our own free will and choice. Satan's plan was, I'll make sure everybody gets there. I'll make sure they do what's right. God's plan was to give us a choice, and we do it because of our own will, our own desire. But in that plan, God knew that we would make mistakes and we would sin. And if we sin and we're unclean, we can't return and live with Him. So a Savior was provided, and Jesus Christ stepped forward and said, I will go, and I will provide a way for all of these children to return and live with their heavenly parents. Jesus Christ is our Savior. Our Savior is the center to Heavenly Father's plan, and He wants us to make covenants with Him. That's how we connect. That's how His atonement has meaning and can function in helping us to become clean. We cannot return our Heavenly Parents without Jesus Christ and the covenants that bind or connect us to Him. So, we were in the pre mortal world with our Father in heaven. He created the earth. And the covenant path was instituted at that time. So these covenants and ordinances that we partake of in the temple, they didn't start with Joseph Smith and the Restoration. They didn't start when Christ was on the earth. They started at the foundation of the world. Doctrine and Covenants, section 128. According to the ordinances which God has prepared for their salvation from before the foundation of the world. 
And when you think of the covenants in that way and the ordinances in the endowment in that way, these are ancient. Sometimes they seem a little different or a little unusual the first time we go to the temple. But that's because they were, were organized or given to us in the foundation of the world, not in a 2022 or 23 style of learning. Let somebody read this next one, please. We qualify for exaltation by making covenants with God, keeping those covenants and receiving essential ordinances. This has been true since the beginning of time. Adam, Eve, and all other devoted disciples of Jesus Christ, since the world was created, have made the same covenants with God. They have received the same ordinances that we as members of the Lord's Restored Church today have made. Thank you. So think of that. When I, when I read that, I felt a connection to Eve, to Sarah, and to Rebecca, and to Mary, and to these sisters from ancient days. They all made the same connection, or the same covenants that we make in the temple. And those covenants connect us to Jesus Christ. Now this quote is from Elder Redden of the most recent conference. Could you read it, please? Before the earth was created, God established covenants as the mechanism by which us, his children, could unite ourselves to him. Based on eternal, unchanging law, he specified the non-negotiable conditions whereby we are transformed, saved, and exalted. We make covenants by participating in the priesthood ordinances. That's pretty strong language. Non-negotiable non conditions. Now, one of the things that President Harris and I have felt as we started our training for this assignment we have, as we, we had classes with the Temple Department starting in April of last spring, and we started our assignment in September, is this is really serious business. <laughs> the recording of temple ordinances is serious and very meticulous and careful because we're creating the book of life by which all mankind will be judged. So when I read this non-negotiable conditions and that this was established at the foundation of the world, then I understand more why covenants are so important. That's how God works with us and helps us be prepared to return to live with him. So let's talk just a little bit about what are covenants and ordinances. In 2009, Elder Christofferson gave a wonderful talk in General Conference called The Power of Covenants. And it gave so much more understanding to me as I studied that talk. First of all, he says a covenant is an agreement between God and man. The terms are set by God. So it's perfect in that he has set those terms. God binds himself to sustain and sanctify and exalt us. So that's his, that's his side of the agreement. And we commit to serve him and to keep his commandments. Covenants, we enter into covenants through ordinances. And ordinances are governed by the priesthood. They're called priesthood ordinances. Ordinances are sacred rituals or rites that God has ordained for us to manifest our commitment to our covenants. So you think about it. I can go in the woods and I can feel the spirit and I can feel close to God and I can think in my mind, I'm going to follow him. And I'm going to keep his commandments. And I'm going to take the name of Jesus Christ upon me and I have this wonderful spiritual experience in the, in the forest. And I go home, and I might remember that day. I might not. But if I go to the church, and under priesthood authority, and with permission from someone who holds keys, I am, I walk into a font, and I'm baptized, I'm immersed in the water by someone who has priesthood authority and says a specific prayer, and I come up as a witness that I'm going to covenant to follow Jesus Christ and to keep his commandments and take his name upon me. Am I going to remember that? That ritual or that rite adds power and it's done by the power of the priesthood and under keys, authority of priesthood keys, an ordinance makes that covenant much stronger. Ordinances must be performed by priesthood authority and be authorized by priesthood keys. And ordinances are done one by one 
individually by name. So you think about that. Everybody on the earth and who has ever lived on the earth or will live on the earth has the opportunity to receive the ordinance of baptism and confirmation and to return and live with our heavenly parents. That's necessary to enter the covenant path. And that's the Lord's plan. And those ordinances are available for those who have passed on in the temple. That's amazing to me. God's love for us. Every ordinance is done individually one by one. And when you think about the endowment, we have the ordinance of baptism and confirmation. In the endowment, we have three ordinances in the initiatory. And we have four more ordinances in the endowment. That's nine ordinances that are necessary for us to be on the covenant path and return to them with our Father in heaven. And he's provided a way, and the church is putting in the resources to build temples and make this possible for every person who has ever lived to receive all nine of those ordinances. That's pretty awesome. Amazing. But it shows God's great love for us and his perfect plan. So, the next quote, please. A covenant is a pledge that we should prepare for, clearly understand, and absolutely honor. Making a covenant with God is different than casually making a promise. There's power there, isn't there? And these quotes are from Elder Redmond's talk in this most recent conference on covenants, another really powerful source to, to study. Would you read this one, please? <clears throat> the term covenant path refers to a series of covenants whereby we come to Christ and connect to Him. Through this covenant bond, we have access to His internal power. The path begins with faith in Jesus Christ and repentance, followed by baptism and receiving the Holy Ghost. Thank you. So as we've been baptized and received the Holy Ghost, we have entered this covenant path. And the next covenants that we need to receive are those in the temple of David. Now, when we were baptized at eight, we had 10, 11 years before it's possible for us to make those other covenants for ourselves personally. When we're baptized in our adult life, we have to wait at least a year. When we're baptized in Doctrine and Covenants section 20, it says those who are willing can enter the, the covenant path through baptism. But when you go to the bishop and are asked those questions to receive a temple recommend, the word isn't willing, it is, are you doing? And so to receive the covenants and ordinances of the endowment, we need to be doing the things that we covenant and we said we were willing to do when we were baptized. Now this next slide, this is a screenshot of the church website under temples, and this has been updated in recent months, and it's just amazing. I invite all of you to go to the website and look up temples. You go to churchofjesuschrist.org, and you click on serve, and then you come down and it has temples, and if you click on temples, it takes you to a brand new website. And on that website, oh my goodness, it has all kinds of headings, inside temples, a tour of the Washington, D.C. temple, Prepare for the house of the Lord and a whole section of resources on how to prepare for endowments to help your children who are preparing for missions or to receive their endowments to study that. It has a section on proxy baptism and confirmation about the temple endowment, about temple seedings, prophetic teachings about temples, and it has links to all kinds of quotes and talks by our prophets and apostles. And it has um, a link about sacred temple clothing with videos of explanation. This is an amazing site, so take a look at that. You can learn so much from there. And the thing that's so exciting to us is it's much more clear about what we do in the temple. It's a good way to help prepare us. Um, the first section on here is an overview of the temple and down. We're not going to read this whole thing, but it said that when you join the church, you receive the ordinance of baptism. And there's baptism and confirmation. There are two parts to that. When you go to the temple to receive your endowment, there are also two parts to that. There's the initiatory and there's the endowment. And in the initiatory, these ordinances include special blessings regarding your divine heritage and potential. I think that's such an amazing example of teaching for us. Before we make those covenants of the endowment, the Lord tells us who we are. 
helps us understand our divine nature. And I thought about that with teaching our children. I wish I had understood this when my children were little. But if we can teach our children who they are, our grandchildren who they are, before they ever leave to go to school and are hearing all these other messages from the world, what a blessing, what a strength to them. Teach them who they are and their divine nature. And then as we go into the, to the endowment presentation, we make covenants and we participate in ordinances. And those five covenants are listed here on the, on the church website. We covenant to obey the law of obedience. We covenant to obey the law of sacrifice. We covenant to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ and to live as he taught us to live. We covenant to keep the law of chastity and to consecrate ourselves, all we have and all that we will become, to the building up of the kingdom of God. Those are the covenants we make. And isn't that powerful to be able to read that and to discuss that with our families? Those are the covenants that we make as we receive our endowment in the temple. Now, this, this is from Elder Redmond again in his talk in 2022, this past conference. Would you mind? We covenant first to strive to keep the commandments of God. Second, to repent with a broken heart and a conquered spirit. Okay, hold on just a second, okay? Isn't that interesting? He can say to sacrifice. He said we covenant to repent with a broken heart and a contrite spirit. And isn't that what repentance is? And, and sacrifice is? We sacrifice the things that maybe were our favorite sin or our, something that we love to do but know we need to get rid of? I think that's really powerful. We repent with a broken heart and a contrite spirit. That's our sacrifice. It's our humility and our broken heart. Thank you. Third, to live the gospel of Jesus Christ, exercising faith in Him, making covenants with God, keeping those covenants, and striving to live two great commandments, to love God and neighbor. Fourth, to keep the law of chastity. Fifth, to dedicate ourselves and everything the Lord blesses us with to build up His church. That's wonderful. Thank you. Wonderful talk to help us understand better the covenants ordinances that we participate in the temple. One more quote about the endowment, please, says President Nelson. The reward for keeping covenants with God is heavenly power, power that strengthens us to withstand our trials, tem uh, temptations, and our exposed. This power eases our way. Those who live the higher laws of Jesus Christ have access to his higher power. Thank you. Wouldn't we all like to have that power in our lives? Haven't we seen that happen to us many times? In another talk, President Nelson was talking about covenants and the need to go to the temple and receive that strength. And he said, in the coming days, we, are, we will need this strength to help us in our lives. Now I'd like to introduce you to my niece. This is CL. And with your permission, I'd like to share her story with you. CL is about this 41. And four years ago, after 17 years of marriage, her husband revealed to her that he'd been unfaithful for several years. He wanted to leave the church. He wanted nothing to do with the temple, going to church, serving. And he found a new style of life that he liked better. He still wanted to stay married, but he wanted to go to church. He wanted to have multiple marriage partners, and he wanted to participate in alcohol and drugs. And, but he still wanted to be with the family when he home. So she was devastated. She wanted to keep her temple marriage. She wanted to keep her family together. So she counseled with her bishop. They counseled together with a professional counselor for about a year. And after a year of doing this, it was clear that he had no desire or intention to change. And he wanted her to come and do that lifestyle with him. As she thought about it, she said, I want to keep my covenants. She put in a tough spot. Do I keep my family together? Do I keep my covenants? And she chose 
she chose to keep her covenants. That was difficult because then she had to file for a divorce. And she had three teenagers and an eight-year-old. Man, she enjoyed custody with their father, dealing with the fallout with those three teen those children and the, the emotional challenges that they faced because of this breakup in their family has been really hard and going to work full time. Life has been difficult. But she committed to keep her daily habits of prayer and study and regular attendance to the temple and going to church every Sunday and clinging to her cabinets. And despite the difficulties and the hardships, she's been able to face them with more confidence and with God-given power to know that the Lord is with her and helping her strength and direction. She's seen miracles in her life after her decision to do this and go through with it and come out strongly and say, I'm going to keep my covenants. Within a few months, her work situation improved. She got a better job, higher pay, better work environment, doing the things that she absolutely loves and is trained to do. She been able to keep the family home. It all happened at the time that interest rates went down and although their house had, had appreciated a lot and her husband was to get half of that, she was able to refinance and stay in the house and keep her kids in their home. She's found that being she's been strengthened by her covenants as she remains yoked to Jesus Christ. And this is what she has said. As we keep our covenants, Christ can take care of us. As I partner with Jesus Christ to make life meaningful to me in my circumstances, Grace comes along the way. Don't limit the Lord in the miracles that he could do for us. Her life is still really hard. Her 17-year-old doesn't want to attend church. One of her two 13-year-old daughters is struggling. And her 8-year-old is afraid to tell Dad she wants to go to church when she's with him on Sundays. And so she only gets to go when she's with Mom. There's hard things in her life. But with her covenants and being yoked to Jesus Christ, she has the confidence and the trust that the Lord will bless her. And she's able to face each day with the knowledge that the Lord will be by her side. And she has certainly felt the, the strength of her covenants. So now, we're going to shift gears a little bit. How do we make temple service and temple worship our most powerful connection? I'd like to take just a few minutes and have you connect with the people you're sitting close to and discuss this question. And then in a few minutes, we'll share some ideas. So we need to turn around and talk to somebody or turn into each other, ask this question, and talk about this with each other. We'll take just a few minutes.
to share with us some of the things you've talked about. Raise your hand and she'll give you the microphone and you can share us. How, how do we make temple service and temple worship our most powerful connection? What are some things you have found in your life that help you to do that? So he continued to go every week, and I went 
less often I can't even remember the goal we set, but that I went once I could leave here a little longer, I, I started going back more regularly. Then we moved to Missouri, and our closest temple was 27 hours away, Salt Lake Temple. And so our temple goal really, really altered then. Then our goal was, whenever we're close to a temple, we're going to go. <laughs> and that was <laughs> in the summers when we'd go home to visit the family or when we had a meeting in somewhere in another city that had a temple, we'd try to go. So our temple attendance at that time was much less. But that regular attendance before we moved there really strengthened us. And then in his third year of medical school, they built a temple and dedicated the temple in Chicago. We were thrilled, eight hours. It was so much closer. And we had friends that lived there from Twin Falls, and, and they had children the same age as ours. So a couple times a year, we'd drive to Chicago and stay the weekend with them and hire a babysitter for seven children, and we'd go to the temple with our friends. And then he graduated, and we moved to Texas. Well, this was even better. Dallas was only six hours away, two hours less. And those friends moved to Dallas. So, so we continued to get to the temple maybe once every four months or so. And, and when we go home in the summer. And then from Texas, we moved to California, the Oakland Temple, less than an hour drive away. Oh my goodness, that was so great. But by then, we've got three children and another one on the way, and he's in a residency. The weekly temple trips were not even a possibility, but we could get there about every month or six weeks. And that, by then, we had children in school, and with it being that close, I could get a babysitter for the toddler and go in during the day with a bunch of Relief Society sisters and be back before the kids were home from school. And we figured ways to get to the temple. Sometimes we would trade babysitting with friends, and I'd keep their kids, and they'd go one day, and then they'd keep my kids, and I'd go one day. But we figured out ways to do it. Then we moved to Mountain Home, 45 minutes to the Boise Temple, and it wasn't the Bay Area freeways like we had in Oakland. We thought that was just wonderful. So then when we moved back to Texas and it was six hours to Dallas, this time we were just discouraged instead of excited. <laughs> but through the years, we figured out a way to get to the temple. And I think the key there is we just make a goal and realize that our lives have seasons and periods of time. We do our best. We do what we can do. The Lord knows our hearts. But if we try to make it happen, he'll help us. And he'll guide us and make us. In, in being able to attend the temple. Now, how do we help our children feel a connection to the temple and a desire to participate in the temple? What are some things that you could do to help your children understand the temple or have a desire to go to the temple? Anybody? Sister Pete, perhaps. I think just being an example by going and then saying positive things about it. Exactly. You know, this is what I heard. That really helps, I think. Very good. Okay, so back here. Uh, I'll make a plug for the temple service uh, that uh, those who are willing or have the time in whatever you know time period of your life, be willing to work in the temple as a former worker has um, been an example and a testimony for my children, for my grandchildren, when they know that you are there because you want to serve the Lord and patrons in the area. Um, it's, it's a great strength, as well as doing family history when you say, okay, can you go to the temple? I've got five things, you know, will you do them for me? And then you can send them off to your children and let them know that those things are important to you, so that they will help complete proxy lessons. Excellent. That's very true. And there are more things than just ordinance workers that could be in the temple. We have volunteers that help in the clothing center, um, volunteers that help with the grounds, and the flowers, and the, the beds. Um, there's all kinds of opportunities to serve there. And your stake was some 16 sisters in your stake helped clean the chandeliers during our temple close, closing in March. And that was, notice those chandeliers next time you're there because they are gorgeous. Every one of those crystals was wiped clean individually by Sisters of Your Shake. So, pretty cool. Um, I remember growing up and hearing my mother talk about her grandma ironing her temple robes. And then my 
my grandparents became temple workers in Idaho Falls, and they would come to visit, and they'd talk to my parents about their temple service. And I grew up hearing those things, and that was meaningful. And when our oldest daughter, Sharon, was two, that's when the song, I'd love to see the temple, was written and came out. And that's when the first song she learned. And she learned it as a little two or three-year-old, and she'd sing, I prepare myself when I am young. Because it is my sacred booty. <laughs> I still think of that, but what a blessing. Teach your children music about the temple and your grandchildren. And, and the Friend magazine is, has wonderful resources about the temple. And again, on the church website, for your children, you can find all kinds of wonderful resources and teaching your families about the temple and bringing that love for the temple to them at a very young age. President Nelson said this, I bless you to identify those things that you can set aside so that you can spend more time in the temple. As we're prayerful about that, he will help us figure out a way to enhance our connections to him through temple worship. Go past these. At our Temple President Seminar in September, President or Elder Holland gave this quote that has just stuck in my mind. He said, the temple has meaning to me to the degree that Jesus Christ has meaning to me. Everything that's done in the temple points to the Savior. And as we study and learn about the Savior, then we, are, we will have stronger feelings and stronger connection to the covenants and the ordinances of the temple the covenants that we made to follow him. I am so grateful for the temple in our lives. I'm so grateful for those covenants and ordinances that bind us to Jesus Christ. And as we're bound to him, we receive priesthood power that strengthens us and helps us in our trials. We all have challenges. Challenges of family, family situations, health problems, aging, um, all kinds of challenges in our lives. But as we are bound to the Savior through our covenants in the temple and participating in those ordinances, we are blessed with the strength and the power to handle those, those challenges with confidence and with faith. President Nelson said, covenant keeping makes life easier. He said, now notice, I didn't say easy, but easier. I testify that Jesus is Christ. I testify that we have a Father in heaven who loves us. He loves us so much to make these ordinances and covenants available to every one of his spirit children. And we are blessed as we participate in temple work to bring those covenants and ordinances to all of God's children. We are blessed as we seek out our ancestry and our family and our family tree, and then take those names to the temple. God loves us, and he's helping us in these last days and giving us the strength to endure and giving our youth the strength to endure by providing temple opportunities and temple worship for more and more of his children throughout the world. I'm so thankful for our Father in heaven and his love for us and providing temples to us. I'm grateful for the connections that we feel to him as we worship in the temple. And I have to say these things in the name of Jesus.